Thanks again for having me. That's uh, it's very nice. And as Rick said, the uh, insights you guys gave are are really interesting and, and worth taking to, to heart. Um, we've, I think, tried to uh, abide by a lot of those, uh, sort of intuited those. Uh, we survived the crypto winter and hopefully we'll also survive COVID. Um, all right, so let me, uh, the, I guess the way to start is, um, what is blockchain? That's sort of the question that is worth answering. Um, to me, blockchain is just a data service. It's a data service that has some special uh, features, but at root, it's just a data service. It's not magic. Uh, what it gives you, if it's done well, are things like immutability, uh, it's decentralized, it's, uh, it's uh, non-deniable, uh, it's trustless, um, and uh, it's uncensorable. But all of these really fundamentally depend upon the security model. So if it's not secure, if you can't trust the consensus mechanism, then you don't get any of that. It's just recording data and you hope that it's, it's uh, good and not, not manipulated. So that was sort of my starting point. And so as Rick said, when I was on sabbatical at Microsoft Research, I got interested in this because I'm a game theorist. Um, also, I've done some work in telecom and uh, ICT before. Um, and as I read these, these new protocols that were coming out and tried to learn about Bitcoin and Ethereum and so forth, I just really wasn't satisfied with the game theory for several reasons. Um, so this, let me, I uh, don't want to be too much of a nerd because after all, I'm a geek, uh, but let me just, just give sort of a fundamental idea of why the game theory is really troublesome. So first of all, um, the, the basic equilibrium concept that's used in basically every, uh, every uh, blockchain that I'm really aware of, maybe a couple exceptions, is Nash equilibrium. And that's a very weak kind of equilibrium because Nash simply says that if everybody does a certain strategy, I should continue to do my strategy. So it's only proof against unilateral deviation. Well, it's not proof against coalitional deviations. In fact, even dominant strategy is not proof against coalitional deviations. So let me ask you, are there coalitions in blockchain nodes? Pretty much, right? Uh, the, the, the mining pools are really exactly what a coalition is. It's a group of agents that come together. So if you don't have a guarantee against coalitional deviation, you don't really have any guarantee that's, that's relevant to the real world. So first of all, you can't just have Nash. You've got to have something stronger. Okay, so that's sort of a academic point. Um, so uh, so uh, how is that relevant? So let me give you, uh, oh, there's another problem. Other problem is that even if you, you had a stronger equilibrium concept, what if there are many equilibrium? And in fact, there, we know that there are many equilibrium in the case of proof of work and proof of stake. In fact, almost anything's in equilibrium. And if you have six or seven days, I can give you as many as you like. So anything's in equilibrium, there's really no stability there. So what you really want is a mechanism that not only is coalition proof, but also has only a single coalition proof equilibrium. That's the challenge. And that's something that we don't see any place because it's hard. Okay, so that's that's uh, sort of the game theory aspect. Um, the other problem with, with the security models is they're fundamentally based in cost. So obviously proof of work is based in cost. It's burning money. Uh, the reason that you hope you've got, you've got uh, 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 security is that we've invested billions of dollars in these ASICs and billions of dollars in electricity, and it's too expensive to behave on dishonestly. So you can do the, act, the math and that actually turns out it's not that expensive for a lot of reasons, but let's just take that as red. Proof of stake is even more troublesome because in proof of stake, how do I get you to stake? Well, I've got to give you rewards in some way. Maybe I give you mining rewards or perhaps I give you fees, whatever it happens to be. The amount of stake I'm willing to make is clearly just the present value of those rewards, less the cost of validating your network. So the more work you put on me, the less I'll stake because I got to pay for that, right? So easy peasy, calculate the present value. That's the most stake you're going to get. I've looked at projects, you know, even ones that have, you know, really big ones, maybe $30 million of stake is all you can expect. It's not a very strong security guarantee. So it's, it's sort of like putting a, a $1 lock on a $100 bill. Um, you know, that's it's just not really good math or paying the, the guards at Fort Knox minimum wage. You know, if you got something valuable, you got to pay them. You got to make sure that they're not bribable. 
So, all right, so that's, those are sort of the problems that, that we see coming in. So the security models are based upon spending money and it's both too much because it generates a fundamental cost in the, in the validation network. It's also too little because it just means I'm a little bit more expensive to turn dishonest. You know, I have a price, maybe modestly high, but it's simply a price. So we're, we're counting on money as the deterrent. And so that's sort of fundamentally weak. So we build from a different foundation. So we're not trying to build uh, locks that are more expensive or locks that are, that are more difficult to penetrate. Uh, building walls is ultimately, we think, a, a, a defeating technology, a self-defeating technology, because somebody can always get a bigger gun. You know, it's, it's a race of cannon versus, versus fortress. So instead, let's just assume the barbarians are already behind the wall, all right? So they're among us, and uh, we're not going to try to keep them out. We know that they're going to get through somehow. It's just a matter of how long they're going to take to get through. And so we want people to be able to protect themselves despite the fact that barbarians are behind the gate. All right, so how do we do that? So that's where we get to proof of honesty. So any well-defined blockchain um, is deterministic in the sense that if you have an input, it states transition machine, it gives you a certain output. If I have the chain data, I can say, yep, that's the right data. That's the initial state. That's the final state. It's correct or honest or true. All right. If you can't do that, there's no point to it. All right. So you have the state transition machine. You can identify truth. And so that's where we leverage. We say that, um, I, as a user, will go to a node and say, prove to me that you're honest. And that's done by giving Merkle proofs that show that you've kept consistent chains and maybe making a query about particular transactions I'm interested in. So details are there, which I'm not going to go into. But effectively, I ask you to prove me, prove to me that you're honest. You send me data. I can then do the math. You know, not me literally, but my node, my, uh, my client can do the math. But I can do the math and say, yep, that's correct or no, you're dishonest, right? So I, I, can, I can prove that to myself. And if you're presenting a view of the chain, uh, it's either correct or it's not correct. You know, you, you have to tell me what it is that you think. And if you tell me what you think and I can verify it's correct, I then will send you a transaction. So I send you a transaction, you go through the rest of the protocol, which again, I'm not gonna detail right here, and then write it into the chain and there you are. Now, what good does that do? How does that give me security? Well, let's imagine that we have, I don't know, 80% dishonest nodes. So I ask, I ask Rick, not such an honest guy, say, Rick, tell me, uh, no, he's very nice. Tell me, uh, tell me uh, 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 what your chain view is. And he sends me a chain view. And I say, well, Rick, that's just not right. It's dishonest. Uh, I ignore him. You know, I can identify that he's dishonest and I ignore him. So why do I ignore him? Well, I ignore him because, you know, I try to give Aish uh, a thousand Bitcoin uh, dollars to buy us uh, his car or something. He goes and asks Rick, uh, is that transaction there? Rick says, sure it is. He sends him the data and he says, yeah, but that's on an invalid chain. It's on a chain that can't be finalized because I can prove it's dishonest. So he goes to me and says, you don't get my car because you've written me a false check. You've written me something that I can prove is false. You won't accept it. No one will accept it from you because it's a fiction and it's a provable fiction. So it's it's just like uh, if I were to write on a napkin and crayon, um, I own Rick's house and I went and tried to sell it through my real estate agent, I'd be laughed at because everybody can prove that it's false. Okay, so that's, that's the fundamental um, of how it works. And um, a way I like to think of it is this, um, all we really need, you know, let's think about fake news. Fake news is every place. So is fake news harmful? Well, it's not harmful if two things are true. The first thing is I have to be able to identify fake news and truthful news. So if I have the ability to distinguish fake news from truthful news, getting fake news doesn't affect me because I simply know I ignore it. On the other hand, the other thing I have to do, though, is I have to have at least one source of truthful news. So sufficient to me is at least one source of truthful news and an ability to always distinguish fake news from truthful news. And that's what our protocol gets at. So 
to uh, sort of finish up here, what we get is uh, we have a mechanism that that generates truth telling, honest uh, honest nodes, uh, honest behavior, in coalition proof equilibrium. So in other words, no matter how big the coalition is, could be a, a coalition of the whole, everybody in the node in the validating network. Uh, the truthful behavior, uh, it, it's better to be truthful even if you have everybody with you than it is to behave dishonestly. So it's a coalition proof equilibrium. And moreover, it's the only coalition proof equilibrium. There is no other. So we can't coordinate on some different co uh, coalition proof equilibrium. Okay, that's, that's okay, that's nice. Uh, we also get 99% Byzantine fault tolerance in the sense that if there is at least one honest node, that's our source of truth. And that's the only relevant thing we need. If we have one source of truth, it doesn't matter how many liars there are. Doesn't matter if China and the CIA use all of their computational sources to try to attack the network. It's just more fake news. It doesn't matter how much fake news there is, as long as you can at least find one source of truthful news. So it doesn't matter if you have nation states attack it, as long as you have one source of truth. So that's the sense in which it's 99% Byzantine fault tolerant. And then finally, we have this edge security. So rather than counting on others to secure your assets, you secure your assets, and that's incentive compatible. So that's that's the sort of technological difference of uh, what we're doing. It's a different security model. Um, we assume we can't keep people out, and so we let you make sure that you ignore the people you want to you, you want to ignore if they're in. Right? That's the basic thing. All right. Now, a better question, probably. That's what I like to talk about because it's kind of cool. The better question is, why do you care? Why would you why would you even want this? Um, so going back to what I said at the beginning, blockchain is a data service and it's a data service that has these special conditions, these special features, and those features are dependent upon the security model. So what Eek provides here is this extremely high security model, wonderful, but it has two additional things because of the way it's structured. Since we're not counting on work and we're not counting on stake, and we're not counting on large networks or anything like that, we can get the security with relatively small networks doing light computation. All right, what that means then is that it's cheap, All right? So our calculus is that it costs about a hundredth of a cent, a little bit less actually, a lot less actually, to process a transaction on a geek chain. So it's cheap because we haven't spent money on the security model because we don't have to spend money on the security model. So that's, that's, uh, that, that enables this, this uh, inexpensive kind of, of security. Second is that it's fast. Um, on, our, on our prototypes, we can do a thousand transactions per second with, uh, we used, uh, I think it was 8% of, uh, of a uh, half thread of an Iridium uh, uh, core. Um, we, we managed to do this over uh, home networks. So we can have a very distributed model as a background process using the home broadband and those can do where the nodes are, it's, they're anonymous. So it's very inexpensive, hundred of a cent of transaction and it's fast. A thousand transactions was not straining. That's, uh, that's just sort of using modest, uh, modest assets. And so um, that's what you get. Um, you uh, you don't try to keep the barbarians out. You have security anyway. It's cheap and it's fast. Still though, why do you care? Okay, well, who needs a thousand transactions per second? You know, Ethereum does fifteen maybe. Uh, Fabric probably is where most transactions take place, which is arguably not blockchain uh, proof of authority type things. So, is there really a demand for a thousand transactions uh, a second? All right, so here's here's where we see the business going. Here's where we see this as an enabling technology. So um, in the Second World War, um, somebody criticized the Soviet army saying it's just terrible, bad training, peasants, terribly armed, terrible logistics. Stalin's response was that, uh, well, quantity has its own quality. It's big, right? So. If you have something that's really big, something that is big and cheap in this case, it enables things that you can't do if things are expensive and small. So you, you don't really see these applications yet, I think, because the existing blockchain technologies really don't really don't suit them. So here's here's what we have in mind. So you mentioned uh, collaborative tech. Um, 
good example of collaborative tech would be things like Google Docs, uh, GitHub, um, uh, what, what I call distributed business processes, which includes uh, supply chain, things like that. Uh, various kinds of, of uh, audit requirements, reporting requirements, those sorts of things. Uh, so how many commits are there to GitHub? Actually, that's a question I tried to find out. I've got no idea. It doesn't seem they can find how many there are, but I think there are a lot. Um, I certainly know there's a lot of Google Docs and there's a lot of commits to, to Google Docs. Uh, and how many rights are there to Oracle databases? Well, trillions, right? All right, well, what this enables in say law or civil society or logistics or in a collaboration with say, uh, all of us are trying to write a document and uh, I want to make sure that I get all the updates and that I know who is responsible for them and there's not deniability. And maybe that's for legal reasons. Maybe that's because there's a, a need to monitor a developer and making sure that uh, a lawyer is doing the right thing, a developer, a accountant, whomever. Well, we can, we, we have something that we built on top, we will build on top of this called a, a decentralized collaboration engine. And effectively, it just lets you collaborate on a completely decentralized network peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, uh, record these the hashes of the of the commits to a document or a work process, um, and then at the end, everybody is coordinated without having to go through any kind of central agency. You don't have to have Google reading your docs. You don't have to uh, worry that GitHub may exclude you if you're from the wrong country because you never go through a central place, and you can do this because the blockchain is the source of, of uh, consistency. It's the source of truth. You know exactly what was said and you can tell if you have what you are supposed to have. So that's a thing that takes, you know, a document might have a hundred commits, right? We can do it for a penny. You know, if it's gonna cost you 70 cents a commit, like Ethereum, you simply can't do that. All right, so that's, so that's basically our, that's more or less the pitch. We've got security, it's cheap, it's scalable. Uh, and it opens up these kinds of brand new applications that can only be done on something which is cheap and scalable. And I won't talk about the rest. We also, by the way, have a multi-chain architecture. So a thousand is not enough. We can get you as many as you like by replicating chains. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, John. I mean, I really get it now. So very clear about uh, the technology. So uh, Rick, do you have anything to add on to that? Or we, can we move to move to our speakers for some question and answer session right now? Um, actually, just a couple of things uh, really quickly. Um, I think that the point that I wanted to make and, and uh, John, absolutely wonderful job, uh, as always, uh, is that from a uh, from a sort of scaling perspective and that's where we are right now we've gone through the uh, you know the traditional seed stuff where we're in a uh, post seed right now you know we're doing the, the token raise ends uh, july 31st um we're doing a modest equity raise but i think i think you know coming back to some of the points that the speakers made it's all about the fundamentals can you get to adoption and i think that that's where what we've done is as opposed to you know, creating this layer of technology what we're doing is we're building on it as john points out so that we can get to you know, say a billion commits or these types of things. And when you run the math, it's a fundamentally good business. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to trying to build. So I guess that's the that's the main commercial point. Um, and so what I think with the, the talent that we have here, we'll step aside and, and let folks uh, ask some questions.